Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. How you doing? Today's Wednesday, April 5th, 2023. I'm Jimmy Church, and tonight our guest is Mark Fiorentino. And his book, Master of Reality, we're going to be talking about all of that tonight. It's going to be science, physics, little spirituality, little consciousness, all of my favorite things. Maybe even some Stargates. Yeah, we're going to get into all of that tonight. He's a self-taught metaphysician uh, metaphysician <laughs> who has worked in the field of uh, the high-tech industry. He worked as an electronic t- technician at Harris Government Systems, worked on a killer satellite missile guidance system, and then at IBM as a computer programmer. After that, well... It's been nearly a lifetime of research into Albert Einstein, the unified field theory, and uh, how to how to figure out and think outside the box of not only our universe, but everything else when it comes to creation and maybe even moving around this big place. And his websites are linked below. They are also throughout social media and over on our website. And I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Mark Fiorentino. Mark, good evening, young man. How you doing? Fine, thank you. How are you doing, Jimmy? It's uh, great to finally have you here, man. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be great. And uh, now, th- before we get started, uh, you get the first time guest disclaimer. So let's get that out of the way, Mark. It's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. And where that conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There you go. You excited? Excellent. Yes, I am. And uh, um, the. Um, uh, the ideas that we're going to be talking about tonight, um, I I do my best. I'm going to make this uh, very short. I do my best to to have these conversations uh, for not only the audience, but for the world. This is the stuff that I have been chasing. And uh, you know, my life of research uh, into ufos and consciousness and bigfoot life after death uh, multiple dimensions whatever it may be um has always come from a different place my personal place and then it has constantly led me back to science and that's what i need and i think that the world needs that too as well so we can get the confirmations of this but science has been fighting it, right? <laughs> been fighting it. There's a line in the sand that is drawn, um, but uh, it, it's getting closer and closer, and we're going to meet in the middle here eventually uh, fairly soon. Now, when I say something like that, um, do you feel the same way that uh, the physicists of the world traditionally um, over the last 100 years are fighting that move closer to consciousness and spirituality? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a tragic occurrence that scientists can be blinded by their own presuppositions. And that's kind of what we have going on here. They have their own preconceived ideas based on what they were trained in, in college and their philosophy and everything that is very locked in and conservative i would actually call it kind of old school um old school in the sense that it's anti-religion and anti-spiritualism not all the scientists but the mainstream guys the big guys they don't want to go out on a limb and, no they and, don't and 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 here's and here's the it, 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 i'm going to use the word conundrum 
right? It, 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 it's almost a paradox in, in that for thousands of years, scientists were philosophers, right? Scientists yes. were religious. Scientists were ph religious philosophers, right? <laughs> and, and, and that all the way up to Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton dipped his toes into everything. And, and then the last, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And the last 200 years, um, everything is just separated uh, itself. Why do you, why do you think that separation happened? Yeah, I've given that a lot of thought and, you know, I'm constantly asking myself, how did this come about where, because Einstein really wasn't that way. I mean, he believed in a God, uh, he believed in a non-personal God, but nonetheless, he definitely thought there was a God. And, and a lot of the other physicists in his time, the 1890s, 1900s, early 1900s, were on board. But when quantum mechanics came in, uh, determinism and all these other kinds of things like that all started to go out. And the more that got in, in, in popularity, the more they got disconnected where science has nothing to do with, um, with God, religion. And I think it's tragic and it's blinding them and keeping them from the truth because I used the idea of intelligent design to build my theory. And, and it helped me understand things that are mysterious to physicists like the neutron decay when it's isolated. That's a complete mystery to them. They got all kinds of little technical explanations they might put forth. But, you know, there's a reason for neutron, a neutron decay when it's isolated out in outer space. And, and, and knowing that, I, it led me to a whole cosmology theory. And, and it's important, if you want to get to the unified field theory, if you want to have the theory of everything, you have to have the right model. If you don't have the right model, it's hopeless. And, and if they're going to use the quantum mechanics model and the godless model, and there's no creator model, they're not in the right model. And, and they have no hope. They can't build a universe on probabilities alone. It, 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 it can't tell you how things work. And, and with a creator... And I'm not just going from like a belief here. I know for sure. So I'm trying to pass knowledge, not just a belief from personal experience. That's how scientists get their information from personal experiences in the lab running test equipment. When it goes down to it, it's all about experience and what you've had and what you've learned. That becomes knowledge. And that's what we're going to be about tonight, trying to drill down to the very foundations of reality and get an explanation that actually makes sense. The um, science, I, I want your reaction to what I'm about to say. Science has always been a series of corrections. And you build on that, right? So if you come up with something probably sometime in the future, maybe during your lifetime, you're going to be proven wrong. It's going to take that, right? It's going to correct it. And then we learn and we build on it and build on it. And those original ideas come from thinking outside of the box. You think outside of the box and you get creative and you lay something out. However you want to prove it in the lab with numbers, with, with algorithm, whatever it may be, you go and pursue that, and then somebody else takes a hold of it, and it's a generational thing. Today, nobody wants to think outside the box. Everybody wants to stay inside of the box, and I don't understand why. why shouldn't we all be creative thinkers when it comes to science? Well, um, they, they don't want to uh, attack the, the status quo. It's... Uh, in my book, I cover some instances that you're describing, very like the speed of light. Uh, very few people know that the speed of light is really not constant, and that they want to adhere to that. And scientists 
in the past have pushed for making the speed of light a constant and declaring a number. And they finally did. Raymond Burge said, I declare it a number. I've been asked to do this by the other scientists. We can't tolerate what we're having right now. And they were out of the box at that time because back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, they were measuring the speed of light over and over. And each time it was over, over time, over the years, it was getting slower. That doesn't fit their model. They didn't like that. So they made Raymond Burge say, hey, I'm declaring the speed of light this number, uh, 299.792.458 meters per second. That's it. And from now on, when you measure the speed of light, you start with that number. And if you have to tweak the equipment, make the little path shorter between the mirrors, that's what you're going to do. And that's what they did. And now the problem went away. Now there's no uh, problem with all the scientists. They can't seem to, even though they use the same meter, the exact same meter, the exact same length, the same equipment, it was slowing down over time. And this really was messing with everybody. But now in the 70s, 80s, 90s, they just set the equipment to that number. And then they start their testing. So they don't really measure the speed of light anymore. They got around the problem by just declaring it a number and, and stopped measuring it. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so all of the math would work, right? That, <laughs> that's just, so that's it. They, they, they physics, it physics is loaded with ad hoc parameters, especially quantum mechanics. And it started all the way back with Newton and the gravitational constant. He, he picked a number. Now, now there was some science involved with his choice because they were making measurements and they had a high measurement and a low measurement. For and, and he says, "I'll take the number in the middle," and that made the equations turn out right. They do that a lot. They still do it today in quantum mechanics when things show up in the measurement system that they weren't expecting. Then they got to tweak the equations to get that answer to make that match up the the unified uh field theory uh you know uh, everybody goes back and looks at einstein's beautiful number right e equals mc squared right and that nice equation plugs and we all know it right and the goal and of course einstein never got there he tried um he wanted the same thing a, 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 an equation a set of symbols that would tie everything together. Do do you think that uh, that it is possible to eventually get there, and something that would be agreed upon by by all sides? I've already gotten there. It's on ResearchGate. Uh, have a unified field theory paper. First of all, I'm going to sp I'm going to start to speak about gravity, but I'm going to speak about also gravity too. And that means that if I speak about gravity too, a new type of gravity, then we're going to get into anti-gravity. And just for the folks that are listening out there that might belong to the to that group, the cabal, whatever they are, look, if you want me to stop talking about this, just come to the house. We'll have a visit and we'll talk about it. But until I hear that, I'm going to pass this information on. Yeah, you go, you go, so, you go. So you go. at this point, there is an equation that I have, and it comes from Newton's era, uh, moment of inertia equation. And I use that to predict the mass of the proton in a neutron. And I discovered, see, this is beautiful, because I discovered what's going on inside of the proton and the neutron. And I'm going to show you exactly what's going on. That is what is happening. The three quarks are moving in this pattern inside the neutron and the proton. And how did I figure that out? Well, um, I look for the signature of God. And this is what I call the signature of God. And I went through a process uh, assuming that there was a creator and the creator was going to sign the universe. And then I decided, well, uh, you know, we sign 
our art. Maybe he signed it somewhere. That's the signature, the thing I just showed you. That's how mass is created. Now, I link this through people thinking that, you know, I, I, this is a dynamical geometry. And so I went looking through NDEs for somebody to see this. I said, look, if he wants us to know about it, he'll send a message to somebody. If you want to know how something works, go to the creator of that something and ask them what I used to do at IBM. I was more of a troubleshooter, really, than a programmer. I got to fix that on the sheet. I, I, I really did a, <laughs> I did a lot of programming, but to solve problems, basically. And as a troubleshooter, whenever I wanted to know how something worked, I went to the creator of that electronic circuit board or that program, and I drilled them on, how does this work exactly? We have this problem on the line, and that always helped me solve the problem. And in this case, uh, the, the task was Einstein was looking for the, the dynamical geometry. He was trying to build matter out of convolutions, which means twists um, in space. And I says, I'll go, I'll look. I'll, you know, I, read, I started reading NDE, near death experiences. And, and there's plenty of them out there that tell, tell us clearly God says to them, I created this universe. All this three-dimensional world is within God. It's within his mind, you might say. There are There is nothing outside of God. Everything within this physical universe has to correspond to laws, and God set those laws. They are immutable as God is immutable. None of this, what we experience, is an accident. It's intentioned by God. And I bring that up a lot in my book, The oh, Power of Attention. Uh, Okay, so, uh, and for clarification, are we talking about the biblical God, or are we just talking about an intelligent uh, mind at the beginning of everything, yes. uh, and, and every, is that's what we're referring to here, not, not the biblical, not, yeah. Not, yeah, yeah, well, it's all the same thing, really, because... I'll give you an example of why I'm saying that. The universal God is what the aliens know, is what some of us know. Sure. Uh, but there was a case where three people died. This is a true case, uh, one of the many NDEs I read, where a Christian, um, a Muslim, and a Hindu were struck by lightning. They died. They all went up and through the tunnel together. When they got there and they stood before God, as each one looked at God, they saw a different version. The Hindu saw the Hindu Krishna or whatever they have, the Muslim, the well of souls, uh, the Christ for the Catholic. And they were looking back and forth at each other and they could see that the other guy was seeing a different version. So the bottom line of all this is it's a universal being. And, you know, we're thinking, you know, just Christian, just Muslim. He doesn't even care. So <laughs> I, could, I could see Elvis. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. If you really believed Elvis was a god. I do. <laughs> I do. I Absolutely. mean, he could appear to you that way. It's That's, that's not the thing. It, it's more like you're saying God is a universal being. He's been here eternal he's been here for a time longer than we can imagine and will be here longer as long as as there is time and and over there there isn't really time that's the another weird thing it's all at once it, it, it's it's a strange thing it's hard to describe but it makes sense in a way because i think when you get to the other side um everything is really consciousness a pure consciousness there may not be a substance i'm not entirely sure about that yet i keep investigating and looking for that they are just describe it as a higher frequency a higher energy but what that energy is made up of i i'm not sure yet but it's almost like nothing at all but pure consciousness that's what i'm getting the feel for right now but here Here's a different story. This is where consciousness breathes into the universe life through the power of intention. 
And when that happens, a whole new a whole new universe is created, and God is apparently creating these things all the time. So now now we have to deal with multiple universes, multiple dimen uh, dimensions, time segments. It's a lot bigger picture than our physicists have been telling us about, and our religious people have been telling us about. It, it's a grander scheme it's immense it's we're just a little fraction of a fraction of a fraction of reality there's a whole lot more out there but we're here in this stage acting out our lives to acquire experiences so that we can bring these things these most valuable precious thing experience back to the father um, can can we circle back to determinism for a second? I don't want to let that go. Um, the the idea. Okay, so this is where I have a problem keeping my brain straight. Free will. Where right now I feel like interrupting the show and having a sip of coffee. All right. And, and so that's free will, right, right, right. Okay. And that appears to be a spur of the moment decision, but determinism says that, and I'm going to give a very abbreviated uh, version of it, that math is math. Particles are particles. Everything is going to happen the way it's going to happen. And the fact that I did this, the universe knew I was going to do that. And it's just math uh, doing its thing and, and particles doing their thing. And uh, what I am saying to you now is part of that and that there is no free will. And but I believe that there is free will. And then I turn around and I look at the the beauty of the way particles have come together and us being on this planet, that maybe determinism is a real thing and it messes with my head. I feel that I have free will, <laughs> but maybe I don't. Could, could we have both? Can both exist? Yes, that's exactly right. We have both. Uh, let's, let's put it this way. There's a few ways I can describe it. Everyone, Everyone on Earth comes to this planet with a plan, your life plan. So there's a sort of a predestination there. You're dealt a, a hand of cards and uh, your skills, your, your abilities, your, your talents. And you've got to make the best of that hand you're dealt. And, and, and you do, you, you, you've chosen who your parents are, are what time you're going to be born in, all that. And then it's up to us to remember our life plan and execute that plan. The problem here on Earth is it's once you get into this avatar, it affects your thinking. And a lot of times the plan falls apart and you need a reminder or something, hopefully, along the way to life that gets you back on course. But it's like this, uh, the determinism part, like a quarterback, you get in the huddle, you call the play. You know, people got in their minds what they're all going to do. They're going to run down the field. They're going to block. They're going to do this. So you execute the play. And sometimes it goes according to plan and sometimes not. That's the free will. And they work together. That's the challenge in this scheme. And that's what makes it interesting. And that's what gives us difficulty and challenge, which is all part of the, the school that we're, we're at here. So that's, to me, how this whole thing works. With Yes, there is a free will, and yes, there is a destiny, but you got to make it happen. you got to breathe that into your life and make it a willful choice and, and do the best you can. Everybody's got to do that, and, and that's the struggle that is life. Well, what about it, if, we, if we stay on, on this track, and it is tracking really well because it's been determined that it's going to track well, is um, uh, entropy. Because entropy, it, it, I mean, to me, always seems inevitable, 
right? You move into a house, the house is clean. When you move out of the house, it's a disaster mess, right? It, 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 eventually, everything is going to come unglued. Um, it, is entropy something that ultimately can be controlled and we don't have to go with that deterministic mindset? Well, I look at it at a global, no, no universal scale. And, and in reality, it's working backwards now. Everything's collapsing back into black holes. The entropy is not growing. It's declining. Wow. And it doesn't matter what we do, other than the one invention I propose in the book, the stellar converter, right. to reverse the, uh, the collapse of, and reverse black holes that would reintroduce entropy into the universe. But right now, as I've seen it from my studies and research, we're already in the collapse phase, well into the collapse phase. Our galaxy and a bunch of other galaxies in the local group are all heading toward the great attractor, a supermassive black hole. And that's being pulled even by a larger one, all predicted in my cosmology theory as, as what's happening. And that makes sense according to why the speed of light is slowing down, because we're being pulled to a gravitational, a large gravitational object at about 1.3 million miles an hour. And so it makes sense that the speed of light will be slowing down because we all know in physicists, whether they want to admit it or not, uh, when a light beam enters a gravitational field, it slows down. So everything is making sense about what I'm saying. Everything fits into place. Light is slowing down over time and will continue. It's a countdown timer. And when it goes to zero, we'll be at crossing the event horizon of the great attractor in about, I don't know how many billions trillion. of years yeah, yeah. nothing trillion. to worry about really for, uh, for us. not yet not yet but but we need to make a we need to get a plan in order <laughs> so uh, we, well that's why i introduced the stellar converter as an idea to undo it but it would take a massive effort many planets together to build the device and and maybe they have because we've seen something out at the edge of the universe um they're called um, uh, quasars. Yes. And the quasars, you know, in my stellar converter, what you do is you build uh, the anti-gravity device, that the same device that they use to fly across the universe in ridiculously little amounts of time, very high speeds. Well, if anti-gravity comes in contact, an anti-gravity field comes in contact with uh, neutronium, which is what I believe is the core of all black holes, along with neutron stars, are made of this substance. When that field touches the neutronium field, the gravitational field that's holding neutronium down is released, and jets will appear. If you put these concentric rings of magnetic, high magnetic fields, touching at the poles, you'll get light shooting way the heck out of it at tremendous velocity until it escapes the magnetic field and it slows down to the speed of light. A uh, neutron beam, basically, that will immediately convert to hydrogen within 15 minutes. Um, maybe that's some entities out there already executing that plan. The only other way that can happen naturally is there's an accretion disk around it that's loaded with a lot of free ions, electrons. I mean, big numbers. Because mm -hmm. you've got to make a magnet that's incredibly powerful to do this. And how do they know it's this is happening with a magnetic field? Because when they look at it with the telescopes, they see the light is polarized. Clear evidence that what I'm saying is true. The magnetic field neutralizes the gravitational field it's their now, science not mine right 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 and 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 let, let's stay right there let's stay right there for a second we've um uh, einstein always believed he ended up correcting himself but 
he always believed um, that uh, until Edwin Hubble, you know, took him up uh, to, to Mount Wilson, that the universe was static, right, right, and 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 unchanging. And um, we now know, well, yes, that is it is expanding. And, and Edwin, Edwin Hubble first presented that in 1922. He finally wrote the paper in 1928. You know, it, it took a few years to get that published. But um, that the universe was indeed moving and expanding. And once Einstein witnessed that, he backed up and said, okay, nothing is static. Uh, I thought that everything was still, but it's not. Well, now we know uh, from 1995 to 1998 that it's not only expanding, but it is it, it, it is expanding at the speed of light at the at the outside of the. Well, the galaxies are accelerating out, it, out yes. way well, out there. Okay, well, but but that's not my question though. But that's not <laughs> my question. Um, but in in knowing that that. Uh, the outside of the fringes of everything, because it's it's expanding at a faster rate as it moves out, that uh, it is exceeding the speed of light. But speed of light in that relative area is still the speed of light. It's not moving faster, right? It's not double the speed. Um, and And so in a strange way, it contradicts Einstein's uh, theories, number one, about the speed of light, and two, is it possible to go faster than the speed of light relative to your position? Um, I'm, I'm going to start off with the galaxies out there. I want to explain their misinterpretation. It's you, You've got it all right in what you said, but that all of that is wrong, according <laughs> to my theory. <laughs> all right. Yeah, Hubble came up with the idea. He got really excited. He says, you know, I think the further out you go, the faster they're going to be going away from us. So we kind of cherry picked uh, <laughs> the galaxies and stuff that to match his formula that he came up with. Uh, you know, I may get arguments there, but I think he kind of did because you know what? If you look at our local group, none of those uh galaxies are moving away from us how come those didn't wind up in his formulation how come you can't explain that hubble that all the local group were all coming together a complete reversal of what you just said so there's something wrong with his theory another part of that theory is wrong he makes the whole universe we're the center of the whole universe we're right back to the whole you know old testament thing again are we really the center of the universe, Hubble? <laughs> I don't think so. That's, the odds of that are very low. So, and then the guys later on picked up on it. They did some more measurements. Not only did they, you know, kind of match the Hubble formula thing, but they saw that further out you're going, they're, they're kind of accelerating. They're really moving even faster. What's causing the acceleration? So they had to invent something called dark energy. That's right. It's the only never been proven to be exist. They had I say to, they had to they had to stick something in there to make the math work. Otherwise, we've got a complete unknown. Well, the dark energy becomes a cosmo, you know, represented by the cosmological constant. Yep. Uh, so, the, but <laughs> that's all of a big terrible misunderstanding because the accelerations if they look beyond and there's some astronomers that have done that they looked and saw that there's whole groups walls of galaxies moving in certain directions other ones moving in another direction and when they and they looked out they would find that there's something they're moving toward like we're moving toward our great attractor there's other great si titan sized black holes and that's what's causing the acceleration you know what if you drop out of an airplane and you fall to the ground you know what you do you accelerate all the way to the ground and what causes that gravity so what's causing the acceleration so those uh, galaxies out there gravity they're being pulled toward other titan-sized black holes this universe isn't expanding 
it's collapsing. All right, so I've covered that. Now, what did you want to go back to? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, everybody ignores because I talk to a lot of a lot of scientists uh, in this area, and I get I I, I piss people off because <laughs> it's I, all right. It's all I, right. The obvious questions the the statement they want to make is a generalized piece of dogma because it gets repeated over and over again and and turned into some scientific truth or fact. And that is all galaxies are expanding away from each other. Right. OK, now, wait a minute. OK, so you're saying at the Big Bang, at the start of everything, that it's all flashing out from a central point. I can wrap my head around that. I can figure that out. But everything, what they are trying to explain is that everything is moving away from each other. Well, the last time I checked, you're also telling me that Andromeda is eventually going to collide with the Milky Way. I thought you just said... Right. Everything is expanding away from each other. Right. You can't have it both ways, can you? I agree with everything you just said. I mean, I said the same thing. Uh, you're contradicting yourselves, and you don't even want, you're just kind of like, let's skip over that. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> you know, no, you, you got a theory that makes no sense, which let's means you. Let's move on from that part. <laughs> <laughs> let's All move right. on. But yeah, but see, the thing is, this is what um, uh, theories are based on today. This is when everybody wants to have a conversation about not only the theory, uh, a unified theory, but the general idea of the status of the universe. Well, they, they are giving conflicting statements, and this planet is, is smarter than they think. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I can certainly... Think about this. You're saying two things. You're talking out of both sides of your mouth. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I've had these conversations with physicists, and then they respond by saying, words, you're using these words. You know, uh, you can't escape with the words. Yeah, yeah, they're frustrating, aren't they? Yeah, that's what, that's what us ordinary people use, thoughts, ideas, concepts that don't agree with <laughs> your kind of broken down, um, badly conceived. You know, physicists are really bad at trying to understand things they can't see. They almost always, seems to me, and I love physicists, I love scientists. I know I'm being hard on them, but we got to get it right. We have to evolve. We have to grow. And in order to do that, we have to have knowledge, the real knowledge, not this, you know, this false narrative uh, on, on so many levels here in science. Uh, we've got to understand things, truly understand things. And uh, there's so many, I found so many breaks in the history of physics. The Michelson-Morley experiment is a big problem. That was completely misunderstood. The abandonment of the ether, a catastrophe in physics, unlike anything I've ever seen since. Uh, that has to be fixed. Um, it just goes on and on. And, and, and them thinking that the universe is expanding on a, on a small set of a measurements, throwing out data that doesn't fit the model. <laughs> well, but, but the, the galaxies are definitely moving. I mean, that, that sure. is. Yeah, they're cool. moving. Yeah, yeah, they are, they are definitely moving, and uh, they're moving towards us, and they're moving so, away from us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so let's let's go back to you. Brought up anti gravity earlier. I'm going to ask you a direct question, and then uh, let's get deeper into this. Do we have anti gravity technology in use today? Okay, you want knowledge. I'm going to give you knowledge from my experience. So can you answer the question first, though? Do we have? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm okay, going to answer so that question with knowledge, are. with actual eyewitness accounts. <laughs> oh, good, perfect, perfect. So, yeah, there are. Yes, yes there we are do. Companies, there are companies and maybe the military and so forth, the universities, what have you. Yes, and I'm going to back that up. I just, you know, I could say, yeah, anybody could say yes. 
Okay, great. Yes. I love it. And and here's how I know for sure. I was, you know, when the book come out, I've been on a lot of shows. Occasionally, people who see my shows are eyewitnesses. Uh, this fellow came to me who wants to remain anonymous. He and his friend saw something in the 70s out in the desert. They got close to this UFO. They got within touching distance. They could read the markings on the UFO. And he and his friend said, it said, U.S. Air Force experimental. Mm. And then they backed off and made this rolling sound. He said it sounded like a bowling ball rolling around and around. And then it took off and, and shot off into the air. So now I have a, I, and this guy sent me papers proving that who he was and where he worked and to try to make sure that I, I believed him. And I do believe him. You know, he's a very honest person. He wants no money. He's not trying to get anything. He just has a story that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have this technology. We've been reverse engineering it for years. The <clears throat> I live in Palmdale. Okay. And, uh, and when I say that to those in the know, they always perk up, you know, really? Yeah. Uh, Lockheed Skunk Works is just a mile uh, away from my home. And all of the research that everybody knows about goes on out there. Okay. So I had an experience just like you. Um, I'm coming out of Best Buy and, you know, the, the store and I'm going up to my Jeep. And this guy comes up from behind me and he goes, fade to black. And I, I spun around and he goes, you do live here. I said, I do. And uh, he goes, hey, man, uh, I love the show, but I got to tell you something. I said, what's that? He said, man, in the, in the 90s, I grew up here and we would stand out on the playground and watch these black hexagons fly around and i said oh a, a, a what <laughs> right? he goes like a stop sign but flat black silent and i oh. said how, how how big were they and he goes from here to best buy which was like 70 feet okay and, okay. and he said it was every day and he said then they just stopped he said but for like 10 years they were test flying these things right here in the skies over palmdale now that says to me a couple of things, but the the one thing that really sticks out is silent, right? So there must have been some kind of anti-gravitic propulsion system. And that's what I deduce from that statement. As, yeah. as incredible as it's a fantastic sighting and I want to know, you know, all the other stuff, but, yeah. you know, that sticks out to me. Yeah. Yeah, there's loads of stories like that. God knows how many of them are out there all around the world. Uh, who knows which of these UFOs we're seeing are ours. Now, a substantial amount, I suspect, are ours now. And then who knows how, you know, for thousands of years, we've been getting visited here on Earth. Uh, so there, there is a certain amount that we know is somebody from somewhere else. And somebody somewhere in the government must have a, a catalog or a listing. And this shape one is these guys. And this shape one is those guys. And this is us. We built the triangular one. I saw a triangular one over my house at night. It was monstrously large. And it wasn't even flying like you would think with the front of the tip of it. It was going sideways. The, the, the side, the wing side. And was going across the sky like that. And it was many, many <laughs> hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards across. It was very large. I got very excited and I was screaming for my wife to come out. For some reason, she couldn't hear me. Uh, I wish I had a camera because I've never seen anything like it since. But Well, what, what how, um, how, how is anti-gravity created? I mean, there's it, it's got to be simple, and, but does it take energy or is it like using magnets, you know, where there's no energy input? How, how, how does it happen? Well, I'm working on that paper right now, 
And once again, if, uh, if you're the cabal or you're men in black, you're listening. If you want me to stop talking about it, just come to my house. We'll have a coffee. Uh, you know, I, safety is first here uh, and I'll stop. But I'm working on this because it's fun. And mainly because I believe it's my life mission to do this is to bring anti-gravity into this world. So now I'm going to tell you there's two ways. Electrogravitic, the way that Thomas Townsend Brown did it and uh, the magnetic, uh, magnetogravitic. I will tell you of the two, the magnetogravitic is a lot harder to do because you need a massive power supply. You need huge amounts of current going through superconducting wire to make the field strong enough. And it has to be a dipole field. Of course, that's what you get with the magnet, the dipole field. When it's strong enough, there's enough energy stored in that field that can uh, induce a gravitational pull from one pole and a anti-gravity field from the other pole. That's how the emitter is built. Now for the electrogravitic, it's the same deal. And um, if you go back through um, Thomas Townsend Brown's work, you'll find that he claimed that if the anode is on top and the cathode is on the bottom, and when I'm talking about condensers, or another word for that is capacitors, things that hold charge, electric charge. If you have it like in that configuration, it has thrust upward. But if you reverse it, it goes down. It has like extra mass. So that's one piece of evidence that says that a dipole magnetic or an electrostatic field creates on one end, uh, a gravitational pull, and on the other end, a gravitational push. So you get the cause of motion. Now, does that only apply uh, near mass? You know, okay, so like the Earth, right? Okay, so you have mass, we have gravity that's sucking us in, you know, in that direction. Um, but... Would that work? Would electrogravitic work in space? Yes. Because yeah, if you yeah. put it's a, because there exists now, you have to go to my theory and you say, well, there's space is a thing. It's a quasi elastic solid. So what is that? That's the ether. That's what Lorenz said was the ether. Einstein used to believe all the way up until the Michelson Morley experiment. But even in the end, he still kind of believed in an ether because his equations were always based on an ether model. So this stuff will work anywhere in the universe because there is a medium at which causes stress tensors when you apply a magnetic field or an electrostatic field. It affects or stretches space in certain ways that give you uh, a field shape, a geometric shape that structure causes motion. And we, we already know that, like, for, for instance, the photon structure affects its motion. They've done experiments to determine that. So the structure of space, as determined by fields of force, which are nothing more than twists, clockwise, counterclockwise, stretching and contracting. Contracting is gravity. Stretching is anti-gravity. The magnetic field is a rotation of space. And when space rotates in and out of the poles of the magnet, you know, from mm -hmm. the North Pole, it's coming out and the arrows of force are going into the South Pole. That's a rotation. And that causes space to stretch. And the pulling or the, the uh, on one end where it's going away from the magnet, that's going to be the anti-gravity end. On the other end where it's going toward the magnet, the lines of force, that's the gravitational two, what I call gravity two. It's a non-inertial, non-contractive gravity. And you need that kind in order to build an Albuquerque drive so that you can have a pull forward. So the front of your ship is going to have the pulling uh, field, the gravitational two field, I call it. And on the back of the ship, you're going to have the pushing. So both parts are pu pushing you. You have a velocity, which means a, a, a motion in a direction. That's what you need to go through outer space. 
and it don't you don't have to have anything to do with earth gravity sun gravity this is completely independent your motion is independent of all other frames of motion reference it's just like light <laughs> it's just the same thing it's the cause of particle motion and that's what's going to come out in my paper i'm going to reveal how gravity 2 works anti-gravity works because i've been able to compute the amount of energy stored in the gravitational field and in the electrostatic field and with that computation then i can predict exactly the amount of energy required to actually see the effect so that people can build the experiment to prove this once and for all it's time for people this world to take action and i'm i'm doing all on my part that i can do but at some point somebody's going to have to get out there and build. From yeah, somebody's got to build. Same thing with Al, Al Cubieri drive. Well, but the, his drive, okay, so let, let's stay on this for a second. The, his drive, this is how he, it was his workaround, and I loved it, uh, to exceeding the speed of light because you're not actually, the ship isn't actually moving. You're taking mass uh, space in front of the uh, of you, removing it, putting it behind you, and then closing up the gap, right? So... Uh, I didn't see it that way. Uh, but, I saw it more of like a conveyor belt, maybe. Um, well, it, it, it's the same. No, that works for me, too. Yeah. But, but, but here's the thing. Well, I'm not even um, sure if that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Um, you know, to... to, to yeah, going back to like maybe uh, thinking of a, maybe folding space or you know bringing two points together where you're 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 traveling that distance without traveling you're taking one step right the ship doesn't really move you're taking something out and putting behind it and he said it's it it it, it, it theoretically it'll work but it would take the the energy of, of the universe uh, to, yeah. to make this. Because but, he wants to fold space. He want, He's using gravity one. Okay. That so would be lethal. Your, yeah. So with your, I'm actually, it's right here in my notes, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the lethal side of this. But in your instance, um, with gravity in front and gravity in back, is is this moving in a in a line in a linear or is the ship traveling or is it operating more of the albert uh, Al, alcubierre's principles it is i use the thing called the slip wave uh, what, is, what is the slip wave that's my version of the albuquerque drive it's it's the corrected version. It's a copy of how particles move. Uh, the photon, you know, ask a physicist how a photon moves and you'll get all kinds of answers. Uh, usually you'll know, start kicking the dirt and looking down and, you know, <laughs> it, you know, Einstein tried to figure it out because if you want to have the unified field theory, you have to know that because yeah. all the particles in the universe are moving on their own independent quickly and yeah. and and, and so, apparently forever an infinite energy source well there what's happening is in the slip wave the albuquerque drive because he's using gravity one the the kind of inertial gravity it's contractive gravity uh it's subject to all of the lorenz transformation problems in other words the front of the ship if you even could generate this huge mass uh, the, for this gravitational field, the front of the ship would compress as you went to the speed of light. Um, your mass would increase even more. Your inertial resistance would increase to an extraordinary number, requiring all of the energy in the universe just to get you to the speed of light. Mm -hmm. that, that drive will not work. Mm -hmm. And if it did the front of the ship would drop into a black hole and everybody would be killed. You have to use gravity too, which is non-inertial, non-contractive. The entire bubble, the slip wave, is 
space that's pulled apart. Look, okay, this is tricky. Okay. This is tricky. So hang in there with me. I got you. This is good. Uh, this is very tricky, but very important. Distance equals rate times time. Now, your average physicist is going to say, oh, well, space is really an empty void. It's not made of nothing. Wrong. And how can I prove that? Well, well there's lots of evidence. First of all, space has properties of permittivity and permeability. How can something that doesn't exist have physical measurable properties? Two, space has photons moving through it. Photons are transverse waves. Why is that important? Transverse waves are wa it's a, a wave going up and down and a wave going this, like that. Uh, transverse waves commonly and most, most almost always occur in solids. More evidence that space is a thing because photons take time to traverse between here and the sun. If space were made of nothing, distance equals rate times time, do the calculation. Mm -hmm. If space were equal to nothing, it would take zero time for light to get here, and we never see that happen. Ever. Which That's is right. what exactly what Einstein said. He, sa he said in his speech, Ether and General Relativity, at the very end, uh, if space wasn't an ether, there, therefore there, uh, there would be no space-time intervals in the physical sense. He's saying the same thing. That's exactly what I'm saying. There would be no interval, no time interval, because it would take zero time for anything to happen. And we well, never I, see that. Well, and he also proved, and and I loved how uh, he came about this without seeing it. He proved that uh, the lens effect, right? He just showed that uh, light can move around a star. And that's why we see, uh, you know, it took the eclipse of 1933 or whatever it was to uh uh, when when the sun was photographed, and then we photographed stars behind the sun that weren't supposed to be there. Well, <laughs> but, and and so in doing that, not only uh, is there time and space time, and that time shifts uh, around mass with gravity, right? And we understand that now. Um, it's it's become second grade education today. It's so accepted, but that's the same thing with light. So light has to change its speed. It can't be a constant. It just can't. If if space is what uh, uh, Einstein always did the uh, the the rubber sheet right with with the with the bowling ball in the middle. That's what modern day scientists yeah. use. That's a really a poor example. It, it, but it is, but it uh, says it, it clearly. It, so. Yeah, yeah, it gives you a visual look because visual. what is happening. Oh, Lordy. What is really, really happening is it's all about contraction of space. That's that's what my theory really. Gravity is caused by the accelerated motion of fundamental unbalanced charges. When charges move in this way, they cause space in and around the particle to contract. That's what my paper talks about. Einstein was working on the same idea. He got the idea from Ehrenfest. In the Ehrenfest paradox. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I am. Excellent. Well, in that paradox, you know, there's a spinning disc and it's contracting. The little rods around the edges are contracting. That's physically really happening. It's not just an abstract idea. And that contraction at that area. So the thing that I showed you, this, is not only doing this, that's accelerated motion. See that? Anything that's moving in a curve like that's accelerated motion. Not only is it are the three quarks doing that, but it's rolling and it's spinning. The end result is a perfectly rapidly processing rotating sphere. And so you will get the gravitational field perfectly. No poles, just like we see in Mother Nature, all around each and every atom. It's by virtue of those moving charges accelerating through space using the Ehrenfest paradox concept model, which then I mathematically computed in my paper. And I was able to get the masses of both the neutron and the proton perfectly. 
And that's all that needed to happen. No other particles, no graviton particles, no interacting with anything but space. It's never really been about a particle to particle interaction like quantum mechanics says. That's secondary. The real action, the real magic happens between particles and space, a motion from particles through space. We need to take a break uh, right here. So let's let's get this in. And when we come back, <clears throat> we're going to continue this. We're going to stay right there. And we can't have this discussion at this point without talking about entanglement. And we will do all of that and much more. Mark Fiorentino is our guest tonight, the master of reality. Stay right there. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. And we'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church, and I want to introduce you to Life Waves X39 Stem Cell Activation Patch, which has totally transformed my health, my sleep, brain, and my eyes. I no longer need reading glasses. X39 is a true breakthrough in regenerative science. Using light, X39's patented age reversal technology is clinically proven to signal the activation of younger stem cells, accelerating the body's natural healing process. X39 promotes restoration and rejuvenation, bringing the life-changing benefits that I've experienced. By naturally elevating a master signaling peptide in the body, X39 boosts vitality, health and wellness, and resets 4,000 genes to a younger, healthier state. It's one patch, once a day, and you can turn back time with X39. Just go to HealingWorksNow.com. That's works with an X. HealingWorksNow.com. Hey, everybody. It's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a Lifetime Achievement Award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixer with celebrity guests. Shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's going to be a night to remember. You don't want to forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I want to see you there. Forbidden Conscious Awards 2023. April 7th through the 14th, 2023, I'll be hosting and presenting on the Hidden Secrets Seminar at Sea Cruise. From Los Angeles to the Mexican Riviera on the Navigator of the Seas. That's right, up top, a giant water slide. You've got to check out the Navigator of the Seas. It's amazing. We've got Scott Walter, Adam Apollo, Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Vivian Chauvet, Jason Shirka, Robert Grant, Ruben Langdon, and another 12 amazing speakers and presenters. It's all simple to do. Just visit divinetravels.com forward slash hidden secrets 2023. You know you want to go on a cruise with me. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com rivermoon coffee mm. <laughs> that was determined that sip of coffee right there our guest tonight mark fiorentino and we're discussing physics science a little spirituality some consciousness thrown in 
uh, <laughs> faster than light. Um, the expansion of the universe, all of that tonight, and a fantastic conversation. And uh, welcome back, Mark. And I wanted to, uh, uh, two or three thoughts need to, to come out and get discussed. And I have the feeling we're going to run uh, past uh, the show uh, stop time tonight. And so I'm just warning you now, we'll, we'll do a, a few extra minutes if we don't get it all in. Um, if we have... Um, yeah, you know, space is empty, but yet something is pushing and and moving things around. Um, we have the creation of dark matter, which now you know these estimates that we have we have uh, uh, matter, we have antimatter. It, 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 again, stuff we can't see, and, and and dark matter. It's called dark matter because it doesn't emit light, and therefore we can't see it, but we think that it's there, and and that's must be what's going on but if they get their way then space is not empty if dark matter is real and it's pushing stuff around then it's not empty again it's a paradoxical statement it doesn't it doesn't fit what they have been saying there's that issue the second issue is entanglement because if nothing exceeds the speed of light but yet a particle here on Earth can affect a particle in zeta reticuli at the exact same time, that's not faster than the speed of light. That's faster than the speed of now. And that that contradicts itself too, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, I've given EPR a lot of thought, and I think it's a misinterpretation of what's actually happening. I think Einstein's explanation about when the create the two particles are created, they have all their settings and so forth and as they go apart. You know, one's polarized this way, one other one's polarized this way. Um, I think that interpretation is correct, even though the math of quantum mechanics can predict to a higher accuracy the the probabilities of a matching, which has convinced the the quantum mechanics people to think there's some sort of spooky action at a distance. It implies that, um, but nothing really can travel faster than the speed of light unless they were. And I tried models where they're interconnected by an ever stretching uh, piece of space that when you do that would allow the speed of light to be faster and communicate back and forth. But, and there's ways that you could test for that, but I, I just, I, I don't think that they've interpreted it right. And um, well, and they, and they, okay. So here's the general statement that you can change. <clears throat> you can change a particle with observation. Right. And it, uh, now, so what they are said, so literally you look at something and you can change it, change its spin, for instance, right? Okay, and that, and so something like that occurs, and the entangled particle at that exact time uh, will also alter its spin and spin direction. And we're almost talking about telepathy, or we're talking about, you know, some serious woo. But they say that the math, the equations support this. It, it, do you do you believe that to be true? That if you observe something, you can you can change it. I would really. Well, of course, that's true. I mean, you can't observe something without affecting it uh, at the very small level, uh, and I'm talking about just particles right now because you got to bounce something off of them so you physically affect them so if i go on and look at something i'm using uh, photons or whatever i got to bounce off of them and then it comes back and it's picked up by a sensor or something you affect its motion you affect its spin you affect its direction so there's nothing magical about that it's the measurement problem it's been around for forever so yeah okay but what i don't believe it's it's magical it's you know consciousness doing it it's <laughs> it's something like that or it's some sort of unseen 
an understandable force at work, uh, the, the force of probability or something that's causing the changes. It's causing these changes because you physically affect it. Same with the double slit experiment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, EPR, all these. Um, when you make a measurement, you affect that thing that you're measuring. And all I'm thinking the EPR is, is that they have opposite polarities or whatever. And it's just occurring at a higher rate of frequency or correspondence that that the quantum mechanics predicts over normal statistics. It's just a slight little difference in numbers, really. It's a little bit higher than they expect or whatever. But what I would really need to do to dig into that problem and crack it once and for all is to talk with some physicists who are real experts in that and go back and forth like we're, we're kind of doing right now, but at a much deeper level and argue this thing down to, to where they, either they can convince me there's some sort of quantum magic at work because that's what it boils down to. Well, okay, and, 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 here's, and here's the argument that'll come back. It sounds like science fiction, but qubits and quantum computers are real. And that, and and to to say with a straight face, right? <laughs> to go, well, a qubit, you know, okay, so you got one, and you, then then you got both, and it's interacting with a particle in a, a that it's entangled with in a, in a parallel dimension that is over here, and there's infinite amounts of that. We really don't know how that happens, but it is, and we are able to use that and compute with it. It's like what? What are you really trying to say here? And 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 that is as crazy as a, that statement is. This is the basics of quantum computing. Yeah. Well, there's ways to interpret that. Many ways to interpret this this phenomena, and I I just personally think that when you create the entangled pair, you set up all the conditions for both. And it appears that when you measure here, you're affecting the other thing here, but you're expecting it, whatever you measure here, you're expecting it to be like the uh, phase, polarity or spin, uh, which is typical on the other one. You're expecting that because you just measured it here. And when you get that match, it appears as if, this looking here at it affected it here. Right. But if you assume it already had that because of the way they were created, if you don't mess with it in its flight, it'll keep that property and and can give you the same result and <laughs> appear to a f that's that this is quantum um, phenomena is real when it's really not. It's just standard mechanics that's been misinterpreted because of this little difference in the comp computing style, which takes into account the wave properties of particles better than standard statistical analysis of that same sure, event. Sure, sure. I love this conversation. And here's the other problem with it. If you have a, a, an entangled pair and the the statements from physicists are, it doesn't matter the distance. It could be on the other side of the universe. Okay, well, you know what? I, I don't know about you, but 80 billion light years is a long friggin' chunk of distance, right? Yeah. Okay, so an entangled pair. Let's, let's cut that distance in half. Let's say 40 billion light years. There is no way, there's no way on the other end to confirm this, the change in state of the particle, because the communication back to here is going to happen at the speed of light. So we're not going to hear from the scientist on the other end. Yeah, it changed. We're not going to hear that for how many years? Forty <laughs> billion. Yeah. Right. The other. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that that part of it doesn't make any sense. You can't look. And see, right? You can't look that fast. Well, if one thing that's for sure with quantum mechanics, it's if you think you understand it, you really don't, because most of the time it just doesn't make sense. 
And that to me is a sign there's something wrong with it. There's something, you know, like Einstein said, it's incomplete. There's something wrong. We don't understand. And um, once we understand it, it's all going to make sense. And uh, I just don't get all excited about EPR because I, I think it's just a misinterpret misinterpretation of what's actually happening. Well, I, I love the way that physicists, because I don't understand uh, symbols and algorithms. Okay, I don't. And, you know, some crazy whiteboard or some presentation and, and you know, and uh, PowerPoint and, and seeing the stuff get, get worked out. I don't understand it. But physicists, their job is to explain to us what the equations mean so we understand it, right? And to go over and over and over again, these these principles explained in this way, um, it's 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 way out science fiction, and I think it's more woo than you know telekinesis, for example. It's uh, it, it's way out there. Um, but I do want to circle back really quick. We need to spend some time um, on this slip drive. Because with all this conversation that we've had now about gravity and anti-gravity, um, the slip drive needs to be built. How do you see that? And the, the lethal side of it, which I, I told you we would come back to, that, that amount of energy in a gravitational field um, you know, we're all afraid of x-ray machines and we're all afraid of, you know, some kind of electromagnetic in interference. Um, is it, is it dangerous? Is it something that, that can be used in the presence of humans? Um, and, and it, and if it could, how do we build these things? Yeah, we need to go over the slip wave theory, just so you understand when you create the slipway, what you do basically, very basically, is you pull space apart. The less space is there, you're going to affect the, the, the two properties of space, permittivity and permeability. So when you have contracted space, according to my theory, permittivity and permeability increase, light slows down. So, this is known math here. This is discovered by James Clerk Maxwell. C equals one over the square root of permittivity times permeability, C being the speed of light. So if we affect these two things, these two properties of space, by using a magnetic field or an electrogravitic field, you know, um, and we pull space apart, and which is what happens when you rotate space or you twist space, um, both cause a stretching phenomena. And that's what you want to do. When you do that, space thins out. Permittivity and permeability will drop. And, and that's good news. Well, what happens to the physical, though? You're, you're inside you're... of this bubble. The space, okay. the field, the, the, the gravity or the anti-gravity uh, that is generated using this technique, both or pulling space apart, doesn't pull your atoms in your body or the atoms in the spaceship apart. They remain essentially right where they're at. They're just now massless or weightless, which is what you need. A photon can go at the maximum speed because it's massless, right? That's no accident. <laughs> uh, and, and what you do is you thin out space so that instead of being in a space that has a lot of permittivity and permeability, which affect how the electrostatic field and the magnetic field, all particles are made of those two, the magnetic field and the electrostatic field together, uh, glide through space. So if you pull space apart, it's almost nothing there. It's like that whole thing is moving through nothingness, which means it can move very fast now. And, and so that's very important with the slip wave model. You're in your own realm, just like Bob uh, Lazar said. Inside of that ship, you're just kind of floating around. You could be going 10,000 miles an hour, and this, you're floating in the ship. You have no, if you have no window, you wouldn't even know. You would feel no inertia, and that's important. You have to render all the mass of your ship, your body, everything inertialess. So <laughs> even when it starts, 
even when it starts moving, you don't have inertia? You feel nothing. Really? So it's not like a, a car accelerating or, right, a, or right. a plane taking because off. If you did, and and then and they've been known to do this at ten thousand miles an hour, do a right turn, the beings in there would be crushed. Your, your bones would crush. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, you'd be jelly. Yeah. Um, and and that uh, doesn't happen. And it 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 needs not to happen. If you're going to be able to move at these speeds, especially when you approach the speed of light, you have to cancel out all of the Lorenz transformations. I, I, time dilations canceled out. Actually, time moves a little faster when you're in the slip wave. Um, contraction of length. It doesn't slow down. No. Time goes faster. So I would age faster. Oh, it's, it's, it's minuscule. Oh, it's minuscule. Okay. But yeah. it's not freezing. It's not. It's as if you were not moving at all. If you were to go out in space, Lorenz could tell you about this, go out and, and move, not move relative to space at all. If you could cancel all your motions, we got all these motions we're in, the earth going around the sun, the sun going around the galaxy, the galaxy moving. If you were to cancel all those out, your clock would be going faster than anybody else's just by a little bit. Okay. It's All the right. same thing. What, right. what happens here in the slip wave is the same. It's equivalent to that. So now your clock is suddenly, you know, you're in like what I call absolute time. Uh, this time it, it's like, if it takes you, let's say going to Proxima Centauri, 4.2 light years, if it takes you, at light speed, 4.2 light years to get there. If you're in the slip wave, you get there in 15 minutes. Let's say you go 50,000 times the speed of light. It takes you just 15 minutes. You look at your clock, it's 15 minutes. The people on Earth look at their clock, it's 15 minutes. Another 15 minutes, you're back. It's only 30 minutes for everybody. So I could order a pizza in Alpha Centauri. Take so it down. It, it, to get it straight, it would be faster than Domino's. Yeah. So, so um okay. Let me understand this. The slip wave ship is sitting in front of me. It could be in orbit outside of Earth or it could be in our atmosphere. It doesn't matter. But it's sitting in front of me and it takes off. Is it a gradual increase in speed or does it disappear? It's pretty much instantaneous. It's it would disappear. Like it would disappear, right? Yeah, if you yeah cranked it, if you didn't do any gradual power up, if you, you just is as fast as the current can move through a wire, <laughs> which is pretty fast, I think. Right. Um, it's very nearly instantaneous. Uh, well, the current through the wire is speed of light. Well, right? Yeah, there's it's, people it's that close. argue about it's that. So yeah, it's close. Oh, yeah, what, whatever. But it's so fast. The, <laughs> the ship would disappear. You wouldn't see it move. No, I, I, but you know, you you don't have to accelerate that fast. You can modulate the waveform. So instead of doing that, um, I think that they must use this modulation technology because I've seen it. Ships light up the the uh, elongated, the tubular type, the mm -hmm. cigar shape. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen in certain camera views there's a it's a sliding motion which is like rowing a boat through the water you know when you move the wave the magnetic wave or the electrostatic wave you go like this it's newton's laws you know move this way move in that way right right and and um and they and and crop circles you know you see the grass laying down either clockwise or counterclockwise Obviously, they're moving the field, whether probably magnetic crop circle ones are probably magnetic, and they're moving the field around in a rotation to keep the ship level. And it might be unstable if you just had the current on hard on all the magnets all at once. Uh, it'd be hard to keep it from floating. Uh, because hard on is going to make it, you know, shoot up. So you got to turn it on and off, on and off, on and off. Sweeping around gives it a nice, stable kind of a, a platform, which is what you want when you're hovering. So I would fully expect that there's modes of operation 
that are used so that you know the the emitters are not all the time on unless you're in deep space then they must never drop the field once you get anywhere close to the speed of light or beyond if you drop the field when you're moving beyond the speed of light you're dead there's no talking to scotty there's no going for help there's no adjusting the <laughs> anything it's over you're a black hole hurtling at speed of light towards whatever uh, or just below and it's, then just then stop it's no there's no you'll slow down you'll feel an instant before you die you might notice inertia just kicked in and now you're at the speed of light and your ship flattens to collapses to a flat pancake you're you're pulled back you can't move everything is crushed M mass goes up to near infinity right uh, and well, how do it's we over survive? how do we survive you don't do that you what what i would recommend if i'm building a ship triple redundancy for the for the emitters if one you have to have circuitry in there that's looking at the current flow looking at all the, the, the things they can look at and saying oh there's about to be a problem here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the current is going to there's it's overheating whatever switch on the second one bring it up to the same power so if the other one gives out you have the second coil or the second emitter going on just to prevent that and you have to then come out of the warp speed using the fields which you would have to kind of like reverse so that, you know, you slow down or you stop or whatever so mm -hmm. that you're safe. You have to not be moving relative to space at more than, you know, the speed of light or anything. It's very lethal, very dangerous stuff. You got to know what you're doing. You can't be fooling around here. You know, this is not building rockets and hoping that, you know, they have enough thrust, you know, well, we'll just uh, give it a few more seconds if it's not right. Yeah, this somebody's is, got somebody's got to be Chuck Yeager, right? So yeah, somebody's got to do it for. Have you seen uh, the new TV show? And it's amazing. Have you seen the new TV show? Hello Tomorrow. Okay, it's on Apple TV. So go ahead. I'll give you the permission. I think I have Apple TV. Yeah, take out your pencil. Take out your pen. Write it down. Hello Tomorrow. Uh, and um, it's, a, it, it's a great, it's science fiction. It's a TV series. And now the, the design of the show, you have to see it to understand what I'm talking about. But picture 1955, 1955 cars, 1955 dress, 1955 homes, <sighs> that era. I love that, that era. So, so that's the visualization, except... 1955 Lincoln car, right? The chrome, the fins, right? It's there, except there's no tires. Ah. They're, they're floating. Yeah. And, and, and so that's the hello tomorrow part, right? Mm -hmm. And they're building uh, cities on the moon and they have the, but, but the, it, it's all this Buck Rogers uh, vision. It, it's really cool. But anyway, it's these anti-grav cars. Now, the, you, the steering wheel, it's all there. You, the radio, the stick shift, but no wheels. Could the slip drive be retrofitted into our world? Could yeah, we have like the Hello Tomorrow flying car? That's what I talk about in a book, just what you just said. I call it the supercar. Um, uh, I want that. I think everybody wants that. And and it would change the world in so many positive ways. A super ambulance. Uh, you know, it takes an ambulance to get to my house, maybe five minutes or something. Well, I could cut that down to like less than 15, 20 seconds. Because all it's got to do is once you're in it, go straight up, point, you know, a thousand miles an hour for one quarter of a second and then come down. And, and you're there. So the supercar, what you're describing is something I want to bring into this world. I want to be able 
for our children at least to be able to have those cars i mean i've always had this fantasy of getting in my supercar and having uh, breakfast in france lunch in rome and then be back home for for a nice nap in the middle of the afternoon which is very doable or taking a my wife on a trip to tahiti and instead of having to fly on a plane for two days i get there in 10 minutes because my car can go thirty thousand miles an hour and it's not going to take any time at all you know we're just getting up to speed now with with gps and the cars that drive themselves well we just bolt that technology in upgraded some because you need to have better radar and and better processing system in a, a global network of, of awareness of where all the other supercars are and where they're going um so that yeah, it can they just have the same speed limits you know you still you, you you still can't go over 80 miles an hour in montana well, you locally you could keep speed limits. Right, right. right. Keep, keep, yeah, keep speed limits. But because... you wouldn't need a road. You you know you could have levels. You can have like ten levels. You know, no more traffic jams. Right, right. And <laughs> I love that. I love that. We've been promised that for so many years. I thought for sure in 1970. Right, I was I was seven years old in 1970. You and I are the same age. So you were 70 and uh, seven years old in 1970. What were we promised? And I, I was completely convinced by the year 2000 that you and I were going to be at the Holiday Inn Satellite Hotel orbiting the Earth, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I thought that the Jetsons, was a, uh, that was a guarantee. Well, the uh, supercar, can, you can do all. You can go to the moon, no problem. Go to Mars, 15 minutes. It's... And I suspect they're already doing this because I, I just see little funny things going on on Mars. Like, how do those uh, rovers keep getting cleaned? You know, you see a picture, it's got all this Mars dust on it. Then a few months later, it's perfectly clean again. Who cleaned that? They, have, they, they have dusters that come out. It's a robot <laughs> arm. Yeah. Oh, you do know? they? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I says maybe they have some sort of cleaning system I don't know about. I, I, I should work and for they NASA. Keep, they keep breaking, but then miraculously they're fixed again. I, I should work for NASA. How do we clean them? Dude, computer dusters. You get them, get them at, at, at Fry's. You get, get a six-pack. <laughs> yeah, I love those things. I do, too. I live on them. Um, uh, but, okay, all of this sounds great, but where's the power coming from? And what kind of power supply? It, that, that's the part that needs to get worked out. Uh, what, what's your solution? Well, if you're doing the magnetic one, that takes immense current. It's probably megawatts. That's, you got, and that's got to be fitting into a, something the size of a basketball. Uh, so Right, right, right. Well, Stephen Greer is he supposedly is in contact with some people who've got zero point energy kind of things. Look, I know of a person who used to work at a power company who will remain nameless, <laughs> who told me they worked in the patents department and they said, we have patents that change the world, free energy machines. You know what we do with them? We buy them and we sit on them. Mm. So they're already out there. Stephen Greer, he says he knows some people, solid state designs. Uh, so that, that I think, is probably already done. And I I'm, I want to work on some. I have some ideas. I'll, I have my own little lab in the garage. I'll try and see what I can do there. Um, but for the electrogravitic model, I don't think you need anywhere near the power you need for a magnetic so that's going to be the way to go, the Thomas Townsend Brown method. And I think that's very doable with ordinary technologies that we what, like have. batteries, batteries, lithium uh, batteries, or, or maybe they, they, I saw some designs for very small nuclear power systems. Uh, I, I think you know, he had working models, supposedly, and I'm sure he didn't have massive power supplies for this stuff 
So I'm thinking that's not a, it's not as nearly as a big, I will know when I work out the calculations, which I'm putting into a spreadsheet now, I'll know how much energy and I, I will be able to very precisely say, this is how much energy you need to do that. So I, I'm thinking it's going to be a lot, lot less than a magneto vortex drive or something of that nature. Right. And 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 in picturing all of this, uh, especially with uh, the slip drive, but coming up with uh, the visuals in, in my head, I almost see something that could be stationary. I don't want to use the word Stargate, but I just did. <laughs> Where... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love the movie for sure. And yeah. the TV series. Uh, Stargate Universe was the best one. It was just two seasons, and I can't believe they did do a third season. But anyway, the um, the idea behind this, and, and even the Al Cubieri drive, where you're taking a step in, right? And, and is this... Is it the creation of a wormhole, or are we, or are we folding space? Um, was this something that the ancients knew about or maybe witnessed? And I'm just talking about these principles that have been there um, uh, for thousands of years. These ideas have, have, have been uh, right there in front of us. Um, could the slip drive and your technology that you're talking about right now represent the, the same thing? I think a version of it can be used, but I wrote a chapter on Stargates um, and how I think they would be built. Very high level. Um, the first thing, you, you, what you really want to do is open a portal, a gateway, and and not, um, there's no motion really involved in <laughs> in it uh other than you walk through or you pass through it so how you do this is you buy a space again and and the, the first thing i knew when i started writing that chapter i said something is going to have to go faster than the speed of light so i was given some hints by a psychic who told me that the other side wants me to write a chapter on Stargates. And I said, well, you know, I really don't know that much about Stargate. Uh, I'm going to need some help because I I only have a very vague idea how that might work. Well, he says, we already have them, first of all, according to the psychic. Her name is Tamara Richardson. And a very good psychic, by the way. And uh, amazing psychic. And um, I says, well, can you give me any clues he says yeah they use fractal lenses since i never heard of that <laughs> so all right i went home and i started writing this this is all i know is i need something that's going to move light fa faster than the speed of light why why would i say that because i know the space is going to have to be tuned it's going to have to vibrate at incredibly high frequencies in order to open the portal up so you got to hit space or, you know, framework like they show on the show mm -hmm. coming out of there using lasers and, and so forth, high powered lasers. Uh, you shoot it into the fractal lens, which I found actually exists. <laughs> and I never even heard of that. I says, huh, what a lucky guess. This lady is not really a physicist. And, and they're saying, so I, I look up fractal lenses and it turns out I uh, find them on ResearchGate and I'm reading about them and they're made of metamaterials. I bet you, you know what metamaterials I are. do. Now let's see what they do. Do you know what they do precisely here that would make light go faster? Uh, what the, the metamaterials or the fractal lenses? The fractal lenses, which are made of the metamaterials, right. are designed in a certain way to reduce permittivity and permeability, back to them again, inside of the material. According to that equation I gave you, C equals 1 over the square root of permittivity times permeability. If I reduce that number, and, and with, with this type of metamaterial, it actually makes negative refracts or bends the light in the opposite direction um 
uh, so that, okay, you can make the material slightly negative so that you cancel out the actual permittivity and permeability in the free space that's going through the material. Now you're at zero uh, if you tune it right. So now they're claiming that they shine a, a light beam through it and it goes infinitely fast. That's their claim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not going to argue with it because it makes sense. If, if you actually have done that, it's what we should expect to see. So but the, the that's the material that's used in the Stargate. So right. you shine the light beam through it. Maybe they do sound as well with... Um, so you get a vibration. You want the space around this portal. <clears throat> uh, that's okay. Uh, so this is, this is where I get to ask the doofus question. But if we step into the light, what happens to us? You, won't see, you will not see any light because remember the light going through the metamaterial is accelerating way beyond this, its normal speed which is going to have an effect of compressing the frequency what, well what? beyond but the that, frequency. Okay. Um, this is where I'm going to jump in and say that sounds like it would affect time, but I don't know about space. It could be used either way. You can make time portals, time dimensional portals, uh, distance portals, uh, if you know the physics of how to tune and how that's going to affect space, which I have no idea. Well, uh, Einstein I, I, wrote about this. Okay, so if we if we consider uh, that I'm going to go there, the Einstein Rosen Bridge. Okay, I'm just <laughs> going to go there, um, and he it, it was let's let's just go with the math because he didn't actually use the word stargates or wormholes. Okay. That came later. Uh, it was the, it was extrapolated, uh, from, from the math and, and it was there, but that being said, um, they could exist in nature or maybe they could be created as well. Right. So now we've got, got a little bit of a dilemma here because the creation of it we're talking about a huge amount of energy to create something big enough for a human to pass through, let alone just a particle, right, to pass through. So that's a huge amount of energy. But if they exist in nature, we, we just need a Thomas guide, right? We need a Thomas. Where are they? Okay, you've 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 taken a turn a little bit, but it's, it's it definitely is relatable here. It, it makes sense what you're saying. Yes, you can. You know, the first Stargate, you know, what the first one was, and it, it does have to do with Einstein, was the Philadelphia experiment. Okay. And in that experiment, they used magnetic resonant fields. Uh, and that was biasing space. That was affecting space. And that had effects on time. <coughs> I have a bit of a cold. That's okay. Got a drink. Got a drink. I do this every single night, Mark. There's a reason <clears throat> why this is sitting right next to me. Yeah. So that was the first instance of a out of control dimensional portal that was created in the Philadelphia experiment. And then the Montauk project was a, a refinement uh, of that using the same kind of magnetic resonant technology. And there's instances in a and in my book, I even talk about one. It's a very famous case where this, this man was standing in a field and some people were, were watching him. This is way back in the 1920s or 30s or somewhere in there. And he's waving and all of a sudden he vanishes. And the people run up to see what happened to him. And uh, they can't find him. They can hear his voice sort of calling out. But he's not there anymore. And they searched for days and they didn't find him. That was a magnetic resonant field caused by some sort of magnetic storm or whatever that probably caused him to drop to another or move to another dimension. So there are claims of that, that there's these portals all over the world in different areas. And this is how they're formed. It's, again, with a magnetic field of some sort resonating and um, you get a um, 
an opening, a portal. So that that's how that technology is best used. So if you want to teleport somewhere or whatever, you don't do it like they do on Star Trek, They're taking apart all your atoms and putting them back together in a facsimile. No, no, you open a portal, you step through, and then you're in the other place. Uh, maybe you have to have another one at the other side, or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, but, teleporting, uh, teleporting in its, uh, you know, the Star Trek version of it. I would never do it. No, <laughs> every particle in your body has got to be reassembled on the other yeah. end. And a what the idea? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what happens to the original you? You know, that's the other thing. You know, do so you have to do? Do you off the or old you? you? You have a near-death experience, I would yeah, imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to be, but but you're right about that. So, uh, you know, stepping through. But how do you, Mark, how do you point it in the direction that you want to go to? That's the stuff I don't know. That's, the, that's where you do the experiments and you say, well, I use this intensity. I use these frequencies. And when I use this intensity, these frequencies, this amount of power, this happened. And so you try that and then you modulate something and then you change something and you try again. And then you start to write down, well, when I did this, that happened. When I did that, this happened. Then you have some, then you can make a formula from that or whatever, but that's how you would figure out the tuning to get different times, different spaces, different dimensions. You know, that's I'm my really best guess. And here's here's the thing, you know, uh, 200 years ago, and you want to tell somebody uh, that uh, you have the capability of, of putting something in this oven and turning it on, and it's going to heat frozen food in 30 seconds into a meal. Um, you know, that's 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 sorcery, right? That'll get you burned at the stake. Yeah. And and that's all. But today. The concepts of you know the internet and smartphones and and nuclear technology and 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 radios and television and and smart watches and whatever it's it's every so we have the capacity to understand a certain level. ET travels efficiently because it's easy. They you know crossing dimensions and crossing uh, the universe is simple for them it's an easy thing to do right and that's exactly where we are at today uh you know crossing the vastness of space to get here well why would they do it? they do it because it's easy right and these concepts that you are presenting to us right now with the slip drive and and so forth that once our capacity of understanding and getting that done this stuff will become easy for us too right yeah yeah, sure. Well, and, and you have to remember with aliens, we're we're just a level one consciousness, very limited psychic abilities. Uh, on on the more advanced, the millions of years more advanced, they're not using the entry level technology that I'm talking about here. This is the the <laughs> entry the, level, right? Right. Yeah, the, the stone right. throwers and the spear chucker technology <laughs> right. that is used when they were millions of years ago. Uh, now they, they there's rumors going around that they just have mental abilities that can open portals. They can travel through solid matter. Um, they can, you know, do all, you know, they power their ship with their mental capabilities and stuff. It's so far beyond anything that I know and I can conceive of. And, and we'll, we'll ever be able to, we won't be able to build that kind of ship. Because it requires something we just can't do. We but don't understand. Yeah. yeah the, but someday when we go to other planets and we evolve and we get wiser and, and smarter, and that, that'll that be us too. But for right now, I'm offering the entry-level designs that can be used to to start the ball rolling, the Star Trek kind of thing here. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go out and see, you know. Uh, that's that's where we got to start at because that's where we are we're at consciously <laughs> we're, we're we need this technology we need to know how to build it and utilize it and um, that's, the, that's um, where we're at. 
the the reports about uh, the Tic Tac, you know, going from uh, the edge of space to to sea level, you know, 80, 90,000 feet of altitude, which is the edge of space, uh, to sea level in a fraction of a second without uh, disturbing the atmosphere, right? That should have, when it stopped, uh, created uh, tsunamis. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm not kidding, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, there yeah. should have been impact into the atmosphere, sonic things, um, in all directions, we're talking about a huge amount of energy and force um, and inertia that is all happening at the same time. And you stop something like that. That's great. But none of that happened. And so when we hear uh, these reports uh, about this and some of the data that came in and, of course, uh, the, the, the testimony from many of the crew members of the Nimitz battle group, uh, carrier group. Um, when you hear this, do you think that the Tic Tac was something from out there and not our own technology, or do you think it's something that we possess? That That is a, a, a reasonable kind of assumption that, well, it's interdimensional or something. But it's not that complicated in most cases. What I think is happening, this goes back to using the slip wave again, the magnetic field or the electrostatic field that it's emitted is emitting the gravity anti-gravity field. Uh, there's a movement of space which is causing the a cavitation, you might say, uh, around the ship, air-wise. So this field, you know, if you do it right, and there's ways to do it where you're pushing out on both ends if you want to get a little tricky, so you create a void atmospherically so now you can move through the air because they don't make sonic booms that's pretty tricky yeah, when you're moving ten thousand miles an hour you don't make a sonic boom you're barely moving the air so what's moving through is like a kind of like a a, a cavity a, a, a zone of where there isn't any pressure see what makes the sonic boom you're moving through the air and you the, the air is being compressed and going around and, and and it makes the boom sound there's no compression because you're going through there's a like a, a, a vacuum almost around the edge of the ship and it has to be this way otherwise you wouldn't you would get this problem this is all part of the benefit of the slip wave technology it does everything you need just so happens to do everything you need so that you can fly at those incredible speeds, make right turns, not make a sonic boom, go underwater. Hey, I've talked to um, people who have been, who claim to have been abducted and have been going on spaceships for years and they make very credible. One lady from Australia, Susie Hansen, I think her, her name is, very credible person. She says, hey, they can go right through the earth. If they could go through a solid rock, you know, that many miles, do you think there's going to have any sort of problem of going through the air or the water? <laughs> I don't think so. They may be able to literally control the atoms and stuff around the ship and get it to them to move out of the way. There's, there's multiple methods. I'm, well, neutrinos, neutrinos pass through the earth. Yeah, so there's... Right. Um, okay, so but you didn't answer the question. You should run okay. for you should run for political office because you right, danced what, around it. The what did I dance around? Let me go is ahead. It e, it, do, is it ET? Is it ET visiting us? You think the Tic Tac was was from out there? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed. I thought you were just no, trying to figure. No, yeah, out. I, I thought you were trying to figure out how they don't make sound and everything. <laughs> uh, the Tic Tac, my. When I first saw it, my guess was it's ours. Mm. And I think, just to guess, that uh, speculation here, that the, that they were testing their new radars and, and the reaction of standard air, you know, pilots and such to their, their presence and seeing how they would react and seeing uh, what, uh, you know, 
what they could do against them or, you know, how they can maneuver around them. Just all the reactions, just testing. Because it's just like any other group, battle group, the Russians or whatever. Instead of threatening the Russians, they could do it to our unknowing people. And we test out their new radar, see if they're picked up. And we test out, uh, and, and one point, the Tic Tac knew where the jet was going before the jet got there. Yeah, maybe, knew the cap point. Yeah, yeah knew- maybe it was given to him. <laughs> might so have been, that's just my speculatory uh, guess. It might have been entangled telepathy, though. Uh, yeah, <laughs> could have been. Could have been. You know, Mark, so. thank you so much. And where can everybody get a hold of you? I'm at www.super-relativity.com. Or you can, I'm on Facebook. Uh, you, can, you know, I leave little messages there every once in a while. But mainly my my website and my YouTube. Please go to my YouTube. I put some of these shows up there. If, if you're, uh, you allow me, I'll put this one up there. Um, and uh, any message, <clears throat> throw it again. Any messages that I have, I put up there. So please, you know, feel free to join my YouTube page and help that grow and uh, that's that's basically everything that i have is on the front page of my uh website though yeah okay and we've got the the links below and they're over on our website too as well and we've got them uh, up there throughout social media i look forward to our next conversation my friend this was just excellent okay. and uh man big shout out to uh, michelle i want to thank michelle she's amazing Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, I I can't wait. Ne- ne- next time you're on, we we didn't talk about consciousness tonight, yeah. and we didn't talk about uh, who that creator may be and how it gets done. There's much to talk about there. Much I to would, talk about. I would love that. Yeah, and we'll yeah. Just that. call her up and make another one for whenever you want. You're the best, Mark. Thank you so much, my friend. Be safe out there, and you know, in the in the unified world. You've got to keep ruffling those feathers, okay? So keep it up. Thank you so much, my friend. Perfect night. Perfect night. And with that, I'm going to get out of here. Tomorrow night, uh, Michael Feely is going to be with us. And I'll keep everybody posted on that. I'll see you tomorrow. What a great show. Perfect night. And again, uh, Mark's uh, links, uh, both to his blog and to his site, are below in social media and over on our website. Perfect show tonight. This is what I like. This is what Fade to Black is all about. And Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJC Ever the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Michael Feely, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tepe.